I'm in a good spot right mm-hmm. at the moment in terms of I I I think I am a person of intention, but I'm I am doing what I want to be doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you asked that question earlier in terms of are there things you're not able to do because of the things that I've Are you up to speed on Game of Thrones? Uh, no, I don't watch that. My wife does, huh? Okay. I know. But I'm, I'm not I'm not, I, I'm not up to speed, but it's come on. Stacked I, up with about three years, i.e. my child is three years old. Yeah. All right. Podcast number 19 of Pulling Back the Curtain, Ryan McNeese. We won't even attempt to say of whatever because you're of so many different things that we'll get into on today's show. Um, Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Tim. So I want to get into, uh, obviously, you're an attorney, Mm -hmm. business owner, host of Spokane Talks. And I saw owner. We'll get into that a little bit. And that. what was that last owner one? of Spokane Talks? Co-owner? Yes, owner. I'm a co-owner of Spokane Talks. That Media. means I didn't know that. Um, involved in the law school, so lots to unpack. But uh, maybe just to get us up to speed. Obviously, the day job, if you want to call it that, is is a, a partner owner of McNeese Wheeler mm-hmm. Law Firm. But quick, quick bio. Where'd you grow up? Yeah. When did you bio. decide you wanted to be a lawyer? Yeah. When did uh, you then decide? I maybe I don't want to be a lawyer. I'm going to go do be a, a tacos. But. Oh, it's all part and parcel. But yeah. I grew up in Spokane, Washington, Spokane Valley. Went to University High School. Went to Washington State University. Uh, no one in my family, actually, that I know of, is an attorney. So uh, the question usually is, well, did you have a mom or a dad or sure. a close relative that's an attorney? And actually, the joke in our family really is that uh, a lot of folks in my family, including my dad, uh, which was in financial services, uh, couldn't stand lawyers. So all of a sudden, I'm going to law school. But uh, I actually did have a lot of, uh, I would say, uh individuals in my life, friends, parents, et cetera, that were attorneys and was always interested in it. Uh, Steve Llewellyn was a civics teacher of mine at University mm-hmm. High School. I'd spend quite a bit of time in class or after class talking about his experiences as an attorney. He practiced in Walla Walla for about a decade or more and then gave it up and went back to teaching, which really? is a true passion was huh. uh, track and cross country. So had some individuals in my life that kind of led me in that direction, but I was a finance major at Washington State, uh, studied abroad in London, uh, taking some pre-law classes there. Uh, after uh, graduating from Washington State in finance, I uh, started a commercial equipment financing business with my dad and my brother. So that's 1996, taking us way back. Uh, time flies. We're actually, we still have that business. My dad and I still uh, I saw that. own yeah. and operate that business. Uh, my mom's involved in it's that business It's an equipment as well. financing business? Commercial heavy equipment, like trucks, trailers, yeah. heavy machinery. Yeah. Kind of a niche type business. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we could chat about that. It's uh, kind of an interesting financial accounting type business. Uh, but decided to go back to Gonzaga Law School. Also did my MBA, Gonzaga Business School, at the hmm. same time. Uh, and in 2005, when I graduated from Gonzaga Law, decided uh, why not start a law practice. So, uh, and my my line is always uh, ignorance is bliss, uh, as you know. I of. would have known how much ignorance would have gone into that because there always is. But <laughs> having having gone down that law path, before, I mean, you graduate, and you don't know anything, but you don't know that. But you don't you don't know, know that. That's why you just plow right on through. <laughs> so what I did know, and I did have uh, confidence, or at least false confidence, is I had. <laughs> Uh, been involved in the finance business for four or five, well, by 2005, about uh, about eight years at this point. So I had a pretty substantial business background, what I'd call kind of the school of hard knocks. Mm-hmm. So coming out of law school, I thought, you know what, I think I could start a law practice that serves small businesses, estate planning, in, in much the in much the way I was experiencing uh, working with other attorneys when I wasn't an attor- uh, when I wasn't an attorney. Uh, for instance, in our small commercial finance business, we're reaching out with very capable uh, attorneys here in the Spokane area, uh, but understood what I would want in an attorney and how I thought maybe I could uh, provide a a service in that arena. And so from estate planning and uh, representing small business, I thought that that was something I'd know quite a bit about uh, and started there 2005. Right uh, out of school. Right out of school. So solo practice. You answer the phones, you do it all. Yeah. Or try to, anyway. How long had you worked in in the 
family business um, I know is new, but when you guys started it up when you graduated. 1996, 97. So by that point, about eight years, seven, eight years. You you did it for about seven or eight yep. years. So and, and still doing it to this and day, it, yeah. so 20, 23 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're crazier than I thought you were. Yeah. Well, like I said, well, I <laughs> like think a fox. Well, yeah, I won't steal this. Well, I will steal this line. It's definitely not my line, but uh, a line from Seth Godin, one of the marketing yeah, gurus yeah. out I there. Get his emails every day. Yeah. Yep. Is safe as risky, and I, I love that that line. Uh, and my kids know I like that line too because you know you play it too safe, that is risky. But mm -hmm. if you're too risky, it's not safe. That's mm -hmm. what I like about that line. So. You know, I think I think in business, if I go back to the start of uh, the law practice in 2005, you didn't try to bite off more than you could chew. You tried to, uh, from a competency standpoint, get involved in the cases at the level that you could at that time. Uh, and as we grew, uh, Becky Wheeler, my partner, 2008, we'd already gone to law school together, so I knew her in law school. Uh, but she'd had a couple kids uh, right after law school. I'd had our first child. And then by the time Becky and I, uh, Becky Wheeler and I reconnected in 2008, uh, I'd had two kids. She'd had two kids. Did she practice as well? She did not. She did. She so did she not. But she, uh, she same had class in law school, same class in law school. Uh, so she graduated in 2000, 2005 as well, but she'd spent a significant amount of time interning at several different law practices, uh, throughout actually even before law school and during law school uh, with some pretty well-known attorneys here in town. So that proved to be uh, pretty invaluable. When you were starting your practice, did you have mentors or did you create, I mean, you mentioned Absolutely. kind of staying in your lane, if you will, which yep. to that extent probably meant pulling other people in for parts or entire yep. situations that you didn't feel. How did, how did you go yep. about building that network? Absolutely, Tim. I think I've said over and over over the years that when I'm talking to some of our new interns, because we usually have two interns from Gonzaga Law at any given time, and they've been wonderful to us. But my advice to those uh, students coming out of law school is do not uh, try to know everything and feel the confidence of what you don't know. Mm. Uh, and, and, a bit, and a bit cliche, but uh, for me, I did have a lot of mentors, uh, whether it be Terry Witten was at Luke and Zananas for a number of years, Scott Smith at Stamper, Rubin, Stocker and Smith uh, at that time, uh, having the confidence, if you will, or the humility, however you <clears> want to <throat> say it, to reach out to these individuals and say, look, I haven't done this particular transaction, this particular project, this type of litigation. Uh, and as you build upon that skill set or in that lane, as you suggested, you're building databases of, uh, of, of documents and experience and expert mm -hmm. witnesses and all of the pieces of the puzzle, which uh, there's where... And getting to watch highly competent people absolutely. practice and, yep. you know, from the side. Yep. And so uh, very, very fortunate that uh, running back into Becky, Becky Heddle Wheeler, her maiden name is Heddle, married to Sean Wheeler, uh, 2008. Uh, she came on board with me, and at 2010, uh, we'd actually cre uh, <clears throat> moved forward with a partnership, the actual McNeese so Wheeler. So next year's the 10-year anniversary. That's right. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, I guess technically, yeah, we're you know, 15 years. We need since a reason for a party. That's so right. The Perfect. Next year's the... Yeah. So we're right close to 15 years in terms of starting the practice. Uh, and at that point in 2010... Uh, uh, Becky and I brought other folks on as well, other associates, uh, interns, et cetera. Hmm. Interesting. How, um, just for, again, for people starting off, and, and I think it is just what you said, a lot of confidence and a lot of humility, and there's always seemingly that coin that uh, mm -hmm. you're buying that experience usually has both of those things on either side. How, how did you get to know those guys? Was it in law school that you had The mentors? Those? Yeah. Uh, I would actually say uh, <laughs> several of them, either childhood friends, dads like Terry Witten. I actually, okay. uh, Ty Witten, very good friend throughout uh, okay. junior high and high school, got to know him as a younger individual. Uh, Scott Smith had done, had been our business attorney and family attorney as gotcha. I was growing up. Gotcha. So got an opportunity to know him, <clears throat> a lot of trust and respect there. <clears throat> and Scott's still practicing today. I'll still call Scott for advice mm -hmm. or Terry as well. I think it's one of the biggest things, whether it's just people in general or when I'll uh, speak to a lot of student groups, is 
just, you know, number, don't treat people as a means to, uh, to an end, of course, but, um, yeah, always keep doors open, mm -hmm. build your network, have as many friends. You just never know how things are going to come no, back around. You're, right. you're gonna, you're always going to need people. Yep. And I think what we found early on is as we're staying in our lane, uh, handling, uh, business litigation, uh, business transactional, LLC, S Corp, uh, C Corp formations, nonprofit formations, uh, handling estate planning, wills, trust, powers of attorney, uh, probate. Interestingly, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing how over the years, when I look back 15 years, the different areas of practice that you end up uh, mm -hmm. getting into and becoming uh, uh, pretty good at. Uh, and we brought on at this point, we have eight attorneys and uh, two two interns uh, from Gonzaga and our office manager. So the different skill set of the multiple attorneys we have on board, you know, these days, there's other than criminal, we don't handle criminal law, but in civil litigation, as they call it, uh, we're handling uh, personal injury, wrongful death. Uh, business litigation, real estate, family law. When did you start to move more into the litigation side of things from sound like initially it was a little bit more, like you said, estate planning, mm -hmm. co business contract law? Pretty early on. That's a, that's a good question because again, from a, uh, experience level, <clears throat> uh, uh, interacting with the court system, whether it be state court, federal court, and we're licensed in both Washington and Idaho, and, and uh, I'm licensed in both the federal court in Washington and Idaho as well. It's just w one step at a time. I mean, you'll end up having a case that you might be handling the transactional aspect of a purchase and sale agreement for a business between two parties. Everybody hopes it goes well. It doesn't end up going well. So in one way or the other, you're ending up in a lawsuit. You're ending up in the discovery process, depositions hearings uh, at the respective court levels and trial. So mm -hmm. uh, as those different types of cases come about, you're interacting in so many different aspects of the litigation process. And then I think as we've been touching on here in this discussion, you look back over your shoulder over 15 years and we've been in you know the federal courts and many of the jurisdictions and uh, counties around uh, Spokane, whether it be down in Clarkston, Lewiston, Spokane, Kootenai County, federal court, tribal court, from probate disputes to, to real estate, personal injury, wrongful death. So uh, l and employment security, appeals courts. One thing kind of leads to the other. Do you like being a lawyer? I, I do. And yeah. when when people ask I'd me. I'd ask that because no one in your family is. Right. It's a trying, I yep. mean, a lot of professions are, but it's a trying profession. I mean, it's one that. You know, you'll talk to some people who keep doing it for decades and yep. decades, but they don't necessarily. Might not actually but, like it. Yeah. I, what I would say. Not that uh, you shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting advice here today to stop practicing law. Uh, I I would say I'm very passionate about it because I, I thoroughly enjoy the psychology of it, the mm -hmm. psychology of the people, the psychology and dynamics of the negotiation, uh, the, the rhetoric, the... Uh, the putting on a case, the strategic aspects of it. But there's no doubt that uh, the realistic side of practicing law, although I wager you deal with this every day too, <clears throat> the, the practice of law is fairly adversarial. Not mm -hmm. always, not always. You know, we can watch shows on TV where constant litigation, law and order, or this show or that show that may or may not reflect the actual day-to-day -day of practicing law. But uh you know, when dealing uh, with clients under high emotion, uh, when dealing with opposing counsel or courts, uh, uh, strict timing requirements at the respective courts, the stress level is pretty high in the adversarial nature, but at the same time, balanced with kind of the love of the game. We'll come back to balancing the stress uh, on a couple fronts here in a minute. But I'm curious, or I'd love for you to share, if you will, you and I have talked about this. Um, a few times at lunches, uh, but really, a, you know, I, I know plenty of your colleagues in the bar, I'm sure share this philosophy, but you really make it a point to talk about your philosophy of helping clients. And that a lot of times that's mm -hmm. helping, you know, deescalate the emotions to say, right. that, you know, maybe, uh, going to the mattresses as they would say, in the, isn't, in the necessarily isn't the right answer, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fighting to the death, going to court. You know, it 
Yeah, and I think most people who do it will say like if it really if it really goes there, yep. there's not a lot of winners. Um, no, it's not. Prevails. And you know, I uh, at the risk of me throwing out so many cliches, it's so true that some is a victory, an actual victory, and that's what you're touching on. That in a lot of uh, business litigation cases, you really do have to look at the cost benefit analysis. And as I just said a second ago. Both sides are reasonably emotional, right? Money's involved, people are involved, and in family law cases, disappointments. Yeah, in family, in family law family. cases, kids are involved, et cetera. Uh, but assets, kids, high, high emotion. But I personally think the job of the attorney, rather than just fuel the flames, which quite fr uh, frankly can be done fairly easily. Why? Mm -hmm. Everybody's amped up. That's what people want to hear. They're, oh my, you have been wrong. Yeah. This is, yeah. Well, and, and we oftentimes, yep. And oftentimes uh, we are having those conversations where we're saying, you have been wronged. There are significant damages here. No question. Was there negligence in this case or breach of contract? Absolutely. Can we prove that? depending obviously on the facts, but, you know, is there a duty here? Has that duty been breached? Were there damages because of that breach? Yep. In the hypothetical facts. Yep. That's occurred. Okay. Now let's look at the costs and costs both in dollars and cents, but also highly, highly stressful and emotional. You know, oftentimes a personal injury case or quite frankly, any business law litigation, you're looking at a year to two years before you'd even see the inside of a courtroom. Mm -hmm. You're going to see some preliminary hearings and yeah, uh, motions. Closure, yeah. yeah. But we often say taking this to trial and winning, is this going to be a victory for your checkbook? And if the individual says, well, it may not be a victory for my checkbook, but this one is about principle. We've all heard that phrase, right? We follow up with, how much is principal worth to you though? Because it's going to be costly, time consuming, and very stressful on your family. Mm -hmm. So I think to the point you were making at the beginning of the question is we find satisfaction oftentimes of talking individuals out of litigation, not because we don't like a good fight, but we want to fight when we think at the end of the day, the victory, they're going to be satisfied with it. Mm -hmm. And there's hate. You know, we both have a, a traditional sports background. I'm a competitive individual. Mm -hmm. But if I don't think an actual win mm -hmm. is a win, mm -hmm. it gets a little more complex. Yeah. So you have this stressful job, not only uh, just by nature of what it is, being a lawyer, dealing with either uh, talking with people about why they may not engage in a suit or being mm -hmm. a part of suits, being a business owner, being an employer, mm -hmm. um, even when it's rewarding, it's a ton of work and stress in its own, right? I can relate to that. And maybe somewhat hypocritically like me or uh, <laughs> confusing like me uh, doing this podcast, you're uh, involved in a ton of different community endeavors, whether it's at the law school, mm -hmm. Spokane Talks. I'm involved in a bunch of outside activities that even I find myself like, How, what are you doing? Where are you finding this time? Right. Um, but one of them, I know you've been gracious enough to have me on your, your show, Spokane Talks, um, co-host, co-owner. Tell me, tell me about how, how you, how we got, how there. you found the time, why you made the time. Yep. What's it about? No, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, individuals will ask, why do you spend so much time doing Spokane Talks? And, you know, Tim, you're doing this podcast and I think there's probably going to be some similarities here. Uh, but for me, I've actually, for about 20 years, uh, the one aspect that I really like about the practice of law is the multitude of individuals. I really get to sit there and hear their story, yeah. hear their story, how they got from A to B, what makes them tick. Uh, so for years, I, I've actually said, you know, that show Charlie Rose does where he gets to talk to people of all genres from politics to entertainment to business. Mm -hmm. I've always told my wife, I said, you know, the question where you ask somebody, what would you do all day long if you, if money wasn't an issue or just take that out of the equation? What would you do strictly passion? I, I've always said, I'd probably do what Charlie Rose does, where he just gets to sit down and interview all these individuals mm -hmm. and have conversations and understand their story. And so back in about 2015, 16, uh, I had the opportunity through the law practice, through the through being in business, uh, to sit down with Ken Adams. Uh and uh, and 
business was called something different at the time and uh, have some discussions about that business. And he'd started out uh, the beginnings of Spokane Talks hmm. and sat down with Ken and said, you know, this is something I've really wanted to do for a long time uh, as an outlet from the practice of law is have an opportunity to engage with our community, again, whether it was political uh, uh, candidates or businesses or artists, uh, all kind of genres of our community. I'd love to engage in this way. Sat down with Kent. Uh, we'd done some shows together and some co-hosting, and uh, it was kind of a careful what you wish for. Uh, decided, you know what? Hey, Kent, what, do you, what if we do this as a partnership? Spokane Talks. Let's do this together and see what we can make of this. See, see how we can engage with the community in a positive light. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, none of us are short of negative news and negative stories and negative media. From the outset of me being involved with Kent, both both of us have been very aligned that let's let's tell let's tell stories that are that there's some positivity. It doesn't mean that it might not be cutting edge or pushing the envelope in terms of uh, important stories that have complex issues. Mm -hmm. But we said, let's tell stories that are engaging in a, in a good way, in a positive way in our community. And let's, let's share that. We, we never thought we were out to win the game of negative media. That's just not our, uh, not our theme. Uh, so I host business talks uh, for the reasons we've talked about. I'm passionate about uh, business and the people that are engaged in business. Of course, I view the word business fairly broadly, whether, uh, whether we're talking to a nonprofit, uh, a theater troupe, theater uh, group, or uh, an author, or kind of some of the traditional business owners. Mm -hmm. uh, and do a couple other shows that we do via Spokane Talks. Uh, the Scene, that's one we're having a lot of fun with because uh, uh, my co-host Eric Wolfram and I uh, are going out to different venues, whether it be Brother's Office Pizza or I got an upcoming show hopefully at Dry Fly, uh, 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 Spokane Alpine House. We're going to do a show on one of their boats this year with demoing some of their wakeboards. And so it's kind of welcome to the scene. We're, we're talking to different business Very owners cool in our area. And uh, cool. show we rolled out last August is kind of the namesake, Spokane Talks. We're on Fox 28, uh, half an hour show uh, every Saturday at a.m. at this point, half an hour show. And what we do at that show is each of our Spokane Talks hosts, like we have a show called Ed 101, okay, all things education. Mm -hmm. Eric Wolfram hosts that show five minutes of a half an hour show that he has done would most likely be on one of the weekend Fox shows. Uh, the show I recently did with you for business mm -hmm. talks, that show would be on our Fox so show. The 30, it's the five different five minutes. That's segments right. From the weeks. You shows. got it. Cool. Yep. Uh, cool. And that, that really has given us a, a great opportunity to not only be on all of uh, I say traditional, but the digital outlets in terms of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, previously Google Plus, uh, we've had all of our our shows, mm -hmm. all of our half hour interviews are found on those uh, outlets. But uh, the Fox Show, obviously being on broadcast television, that's that's helped us with some of our distribution to really get some of these stories out get there. Get some traffic, yeah. What, uh, and, and so how long has Spokane Talks? About, uh, about three to four years at this okay. point. I, th I th felt like it was relatively recent. Um, anything surprised you in that, that path of, uh, how much it's work in, it, the yeah. people you, you've gotten out of? Is it? Yeah. It's interesting, uh, that, you know, again, the why factor, you know, why do you do it? Simply because I, I truly enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't enjoy it because of the time you do spend doing it. How many hours a week do you, on average, do you feel like you're putting it? It feels oh, like it's got to be a lot. Yeah, well, no, not necessarily because I do a oh. couple, uh, a show a week or actually this morning I was taping some intros for our, our Fox show. So that takes an hour or so. And yeah. uh, filming the business talk show, that's another hour. Now, Kent and I, probably hard to put a number on how much you're communicating throughout the day or the sure. evening in terms of yeah. managing what's going yeah. on. But, uh, but I, I would say 
the the ability to engage to engage in our community in the ways that I get to through Spokane Talks and being in the media side of things yeah. it is a nice uh, kind of uh, a nice opportunity to to step aside from the day-to-day practice of law. I enjoy that for all the reasons we've discussed and the challenge and psychology of that. Uh, but but truly to be able to engage in a way that you can reach out to, for instance, a musician that you may have seen in the Inlander or the Spokesman Review uh, and reach out and say, hey, I find your story interesting. I'd like to have an opportunity to sit down with you. Well, mm-hmm. as, as solely an attorney, uh, beyond that being probably an awkward conversation, you wouldn't be reaching out to that respective musician or business owner. Yeah. So uh, I've enjoyed that aspect of it. And how do you make time for all of it? Uh, well, thanks to my wife. And, yeah, uh, your wife, kids, uh, yeah, career. Yeah, I have a 12-year-old and 14-year-old, and uh, we're very busy with those activities, and obviously yeah. that's a major priority. Uh, you just work it into the day somehow. Yeah. Any, any things you used to love doing that you, you've given up in recent years as you fit new things in? I don't think so. Really? I don't think so. I don't, I can't think of anything that it's I've... It's time for you to write a book. Yeah. I, 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 I think books. I've, I've tried to use the phrase, <clears throat> and maybe everybody does this, but, uh, you kind of run it through that filter. Hey, do you, do you think this is something you're going to regret doing or not doing, whatever that endeavor might be? Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, it, it seems pretty clear. Like uh, in terms of activities with, with my kids, it, you just don't miss events. Mm-hmm. You're going to regret that. Mm-hmm. You're going to regret that. However, on the flip side, there are plenty of things business-wise that you deal with on a weekly basis, and I do too, that, hey, I need to go to such and such event on Thursday night. You know what? I'm not going to do that one because I'm not going to miss my kids' uh, events. Why? Because you're going to regret that one. We were talking about that in the uh, podcast, uh, last podcast, just of um, trying to get past that. You mentioned athletics that, you mm-hmm. know, when you're not practicing, someone else is. And when you meet, the, and it just creates this. Yep. I mean, it's true to have a very strong work ethic. Um, but when you are, again, I think husband, parent, Mm-hmm. husband, wife, parent, business owner, um, community oriented hobbies. I mean, nobody really told you how to create a healthy boundary around that. <laughs> so right. I, mean, I think, yeah, everybody's got to figure up, that out themselves. Yeah, I suppose. It's tough. Yeah. You go through and to your point, those trade offs around, yep. maybe they're both things I like, but what would I regret more? What do I need to bring more into balance? I, um, I had a pretty good opportunity, uh, some perspective building and, 2010, I uh, had the opportunity to have Guillain Barre, which is a uh, autoimmune uh, illness that uh, was paralyzed. My arms and legs were paralyzed, uh, so I couldn't walk for two months. What? Uh, yeah, I didn't kind know of, this. yeah, kind of a crazy deal. But I was just at the office on a actually leading up to Christmas, and my I felt that the dexterity in my hands wasn't as you would imagine it would be. I felt that I was thinking about picking up my feet. Anyway, long story short, uh, 24 hours later, uh, I was in the ER and my arms and legs were paralyzed. And so I spent some time at uh, in Seattle and spent sig- at University of Washington Northwest Medical Center. Couldn't give more applaud to them. Uh, back here in town for about a month at St. Luke's Hospital, learning to walk again. Wow. So without uh, going on and on about that, what that does for you though, at, at that time, my kids were three and six mm. and, uh, the respect for my wife and, uh, seeing, uh, her do what she did in terms of taking care of our kids, taking care of me, my mom and dad, uh, my brother, family, friends, uh, uh, Becky Wheeler at the same time as a partner in our law practice. Uh, so at the end of the day, I, I've, I've said since that you can't buy that type of perspective where you mm-hmm. kind of look at it and say, things are pretty good. I'm not sure. I mean, things yeah, are pretty it's, good. It's a cliche in its own right, but it doesn't make it any easier when you go through those hard things. And, you know, I would, every time you say that prayer about, you know, teach me this, teach me mm-hmm. that. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, but not that much. Don't, mm-hmm. te- don't teach me that much. <laughs> I'm, ho- I'm hoping there isn't <laughs> as much to learn because you just know. I mean, it's almost always taught through 
some really challenging moments. Yeah, at so the end of the day, your past is a t- I don't know much about it. it. Yeah, from a health standpoint, it's something where you're, you're, I just had the flu, you know, anybody so it's just kind of a, a bug of sorts. It, that, yeah, you have a bacteria that you're, uh, who wow. knows how you got it, but you're That'd be so scary though. Your body fights your own nerves, so your nerves retract from your muscles. So you can, in my case, I could feel to the touch sensory, but couldn't move it. So you're looking right at your arm, leg, et cetera, and just nothing. Cause, wow. cause the nerves not attached to it. Oh, you just treat it and wow. Yep. Uh, but I'm one of the lucky ones. I mean, uh, extremely lucky. I've, I've been around several individuals since that are either older at the time that they had it, that significant effects. Uh, you know, I have some, my hands are a little shaky just cause of the nerve endings and whatnot, but you know what? Life is good. Wow. Um, to the Spokane, if we can say back to What's been the hardest part about it? Like uh, what, Spokane Talks? Yeah. This outside interest and activity. I mean, it's obviously a passion of yours. Mm-hmm. It brings a lot to you. Oh, I, um, have there I, been some challenges you maybe didn't anticipate? I don't know if I didn't anticipate this, but I would say a, a, a challenge of any business because I think I find part of my passion about businesses is actually how uh, the fundamentals of most businesses, whether mm-hmm. it's a plumbing business, electrical business, law firm, accounting firm, Spokane Talks as a media outlet. Hey, we're, I'm learning every day in terms of uh, owning and, and managing and running a, a, a small media company. And I'm doing the same in the practice of law 15 years later or in our commercial finance business. So you're you're learning something new every day. But I, I would say uh, in the media business, it is a constant uh, treadmill of uh, sponsorship and and association with what we're doing Mm -hmm. uh because uh, kind of calling a spade a spade if if the community in which your sponsors uh are participating are engaging or wanting to associate engage with you that's good and we're having a lot of success in that in that realm that we're finding that a lot of our community members and business members are Mm -hmm. associating and sponsoring whether Mm -hmm. it be shows or otherwise uh but in the early days when you don't necessarily have the analytics to say, hey, we're reaching, uh, you know, 10,000 people per show or Mm -hmm. 60,000 people per this or half a million people over the last year. Fortunately for us, uh, once you get past those early years, uh, analytics for us uh, look pretty good. You know, we put out a particular show and in a week, 10,000 people have engaged with it. And uh, so we've had some success in that right. Uh, but I would say to your point, uh, one of the challenges early on is, uh, uh, keeping it going. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, me, chicken before the egg. Let me ask you one of the first, uh, of a few unfair questions. <laughs> what, uh, what have been some of the most, you know, powerful, interesting, rewarding, inspiring, if I say, you know, you th- three to four years in now, um, number of shows, what are some ones that. Or, or stand memorable. out. Yeah, really stand out. Well, of course, I got to mention the show with you. That was unbelievable. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but that one aside, which is obvious. <clears throat> okay, number two. Number no, two. Really <laughs> focus on like two, three, four. Uh, well, uh, one of the shows that it kind of defines the passion I have for doing Spokane Talks is. Again, not the one. It, aside from the one with Tim Mitrovich right. at 10 Capital, which thank was you. clearly the best show I've ever done uh, because of the guest. Uh, we'll, we'll get you your sponsorship check. Later. <laughs> uh, I had an opportunity uh, to sit down over in Missoula, Montana with uh, John McLean. So uh, I've been a fan my whole life of River Runs Through It, uh, uh, Young Men in Fire, which were the books that uh, Norman McLean wrote. And of course, the movie that most people know yeah. of uh, with Brad Pitt and Greg uh, Sheffer, yeah. River Runs Through It. So as I was indicating earlier, where I've had this opportunity to really just pick up the phone or email or what have you and connect with people in our social media age, uh, I've had uh, enjoyment or success and having a lot of folks on the show that say, yeah, I'll be on the show. Yeah, I think that would be uh, advantageous for me or what have you. And I reached out to John McClain. He was uh, writing his recent book uh, and his uh, background is Chicago Tribune, uh, and that's the son of uh, Norman McLean. 
and he's been Chicago Tribune uh, journalist for 30 years, wow. uh, written several books on wildland fires, which is obviously a major topic with all the California fires and Canadian fires, et cetera. So I reached out to him and just said, hey, I would really uh, like to have an opportunity to chat with you, and I'm doing mm. this show. And I, to be honest, I was very excited when I heard back from him from Washington, D.C., and he said, well, I'm going to be in Missoula for my book tour uh, here in August and September. Why don't you come over to Missoula? Actually, I should say he offered to come all the way to Spokane, and which was very gracious of him. And I said, you know what? Let's go over there. Let's mm -hmm. go visually. Uh, really wanted to have the opportunity to... Because, yeah, he shot a lot of it outside, right? Well, his suggestion, we filmed it at the uh, National Historic uh, Forest Service Museum in Missoula. So as it turned out, when we got there, uh, John, again, being extremely gracious, said, hey, why don't we just go out in the middle of this field and we'll bring yeah. this picnic bench out there next to the old lookout. It, it really kind of it turned out really well. Yeah. Uh, John was an extremely interesting individual. So I, I think this opportunity to reach out again to individuals that I have a, a passion to sit down with uh, and hear their story, all of them diverse, coming from different areas, uh, it has been a real pleasure. That's cool. Something you learned about Spokane, doing Spokane talks that you mm -hmm. weren't as aware of before, just something going on in the community or something about its people. I can't say that it necessarily is unique to Spokane. I grew up in Spokane, uh, but I would I would definitely wager to say Spokane. I would argue it's very unique that Spokane is very very interconnected. Mm. You know, so that classic phrase that we hear about degrees of separation, uh, the opportunities through practicing law for a number of years and being in business, but specifically uh, my involvement in Spokane Talks Media and with Business Talks. Uh, in one way or the other, this town is is very small. Mm. And I view that as a positive. Yeah. Uh, I view it as a positive be because my attitude is, is, is to engage with those individuals kind of where they are, you know, yeah. how they come to the table, what their facts are. Again, given that the law can be somewhat adversarial, I don't necessarily view it that way. I look mm. to engage with people uh, with respect to my interaction with them, not what somebody tells you, not what somebody else's experience has been, but what has my experience been with them? Mm. And through uh, through Spokane Talks, clearly not adversarial, the opportunity to reach out to these individuals and realize uh, somebody knows somebody that knows somebody. Spokane's pretty uh, interconnected. And yeah, usually wants to help. Absolutely. It, it is a little amazing when we won't go into these, but it's also amazing to me, <laughs> fortunate, how many people are seemingly unaware mm. Uh, and thus a little more reckless than they should be. Um, I would agree with that. Just a, a shout out to everyone and encourage them to not take shortcuts. And that's and that's a. <laughs> I, I would actually, Tim. That's a good point because in the in our professional community, again, whether that's litigators who want to fight to the to the death, or just people who are a little reckless with their personal and professional reputations, and but do they want to live to fight another day? That's that's yeah. the question I think that you're getting at. That. Uh, in our legal community, and I can just speak to that, you're going to be litigating or interacting with these other attorneys again and again. Or doing business and with again. them. And I or personally... Or suddenly your kids are on the same sports team. Oh, like, gosh, it's absolutely. coming around. Like, absolutely. <laughs> you should and when you see careful. those time and time again, it it's a pretty small... The other thing I have to... You alluded to it, I think, is part of that too, is recognizing that uh, we all make mistakes. Um situations can you know kind of all these things situations can be really complex i remember you know just uh, i forget where i came but just you know not judging people by their worst moment i think mm -hmm. is critical you know oh yeah well that that did have that one i did do this but here's what i've done since yeah and that might have defined me for a period but it when you when mm -hmm. your friend knew me but it doesn't define me anymore yeah. and well with, um, look at the tiger woods theme yeah of, of recent at least thematically that uh, yeah, you know. I know a lot of people, I think most people were, but a lot of people weren't. I'm like, this guy had enough money to run away and hide from everyone yep. or deny it or fight out of, I mean, deny in a different, but just, you know, right, minimize right. it. Yeah. Be in denial. Instead, he just owned it yep. and, and didn't hide and didn't let excuses, you know, to go back up onto that stage. And well, you're to your point, uh, it was, that was a mistake and trying yeah. to move forward with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know you're really involved at the law school too mm-hmm. and, and supportive of that. I've mentioned kind of always having interns, but tell me about your involvement there. And Yeah, I've been, I've been very fortunate to uh, do the MBA program at the business school and then law school. At, Hoarding degrees, if you will. Right, exactly, <laughs> at, at Gonzaga. And so my mantra has been uh, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if it wasn't for what Gonzaga did for me. So yeah. uh, I've been very active in the sense that I've had the opportunity to be on the board of advisors at the law school. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the most recent dean, uh, Dean Korn, uh, she's since gone back to the faculty, did a fantastic job to bring, bring the law school through some trying times that the country was seeing in graduate schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, dean Rooksby, that's there now, is coming on board and uh, doing a great job. Jeff Geldine, another individual, uh, and Sarah Guzman, uh, the faculty. I, I've had a, a, a real opportunity to get to know these individuals and realize what they're doing. Uh, matter of fact, that's another show that we've been uh, doing a, uh, about three shows we've done called the Scholar Series, whether it be Gonzaga or otherwise. We've started the show at Gonzaga. And my whole intent with that was uh, to let, when I say the customers, I view that as the students and the parents of the students and our community, community being in the country, but letting individuals know what these faculty members are doing. Mm -hmm. And this isn't isolated to Gonzaga. It just happens to be that they're here and they're the ones I have an opportunity to engage with. But these, the faculty and these leaders of, uh, at the university level and at the law school are accomplishing unbelievable things. Their academic research is just beyond me. Uh, and I don't think prospective students or parents of students, et cetera, realize it. They think, oh, well, I'm sure that that professor knows a lot about constitutional law or business law or what have you. But when you really kind of delve into the backgrounds of these individuals, it's immensely impressive. So yeah. the point of the scholar series was to sit down uh, with these folks and try to uh, bring light to that, uh, that what these people are doing at Gonzaga specifically. I think that's true of a lot of schools, mm-hmm. organizations. Um, in all sincerity, you and your colleagues at Spokane Talks, um, we were certainly here all the time helping people really understand mm-hmm. the trade-offs they're making. You mentioned regrets. I mean, it doesn't have to – can be on a positive side. Hey, what do you want to accomplish? And right. what has to be done to help make that possible? At times, that can mean giving stuff up. But I think with all that um, – just realizing how much any of us can be left to our own devices, certainly mm-hmm. how much of society is making so many decisions unintentionally and what a gift people of intention are and things of intention are. And when you, you know, and I'm up and, and certainly the schools in the area, but um, my alma mater Whitworth, I'll be like, you know what I, one thing I know about Whitworth and again, I think it's true of other schools. People are here for a reason, right? <laughs> Don't take yep. that for granted. People of intention, whatever that is, whatever their reasons are, and, and hopefully a whole bunch of different, get to know these people, surround yourself with these people, become friends and, well, and grab mentors with these people because they're mm-hmm. a tremendous gift um, to you. And again, it's it's something I think, I don't know, we're all just so busy that we right. can lose sight of. Um, how many Again, how many things we're doing or not doing Again, maybe the intentional versus the unintentional, but then who are we surrounding ourselves with and the processes and the disciplines right. and how much, excuse me, intention uh, do those have uh, uh, behind them? But, well, but again, to your point, that interconnectivity that you ask about Spokane, and it might be just as uh, magnitude might be similar in other cities as well. But Spokane, certainly, because we can speak to that, whether it be involved in the Whitworth community, Gonzaga community. Eastern, I'm sure, is the same. It's just not my background. But uh, as you said, the ability to engage with that community and and understand that all of those folks are interconnected, get to know them, they're going to be mentor. Either they're going to be a mentor of yours, most likely, and you're going to learn something from them, or you might have an opportunity to mentor those folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, A phrase that I've... uh, I think it's a Zen phrase. Hey, if you want to know what the trail look like looks like up ahead, ask somebody coming back down the trail. <laughs> and it, it's a pretty obvious uh, phrase, but I I can for myself, whether it be in business, 
uh, whether it be in the practice of law, it couldn't be more true because you can waste yeah. so much time trying to recreate that wheel. But I personally have just been very fortunate, whether it be my grandparents, my grandparents were in business, owned their own business. Uh, my parents were in their own business. Uh, I've learned a lot from those that have come before me. So I've had some great opportunities. It may be one of the few things that I've done right. <laughs> and not that I've done it, not done right, but, uh, just, yeah, just, I, I was blessed to have so many people come in before I even knew better mm -hmm. and mentor again, both family, but a lot of people outside my family reinforcing again, a lot of the things my parents were about. Cause I'm, I, I'm always had a great relationship with my parents, but I think part of the reason it stuck that way and stayed that way even through the so-called teenage years was kind of everyone around those tribes was saying some version of the same thing. Right. And you thought you know? maybe I should stick to that. And, but then on the, the flip side to that too, um, and I'll caution students, this is, you know, there is so much to be learned. You do not have to reinvent all the wheels and, and learn from all the skin knees yourself. Like you mm -hmm. can listen to those people who've come before us, tons of people, um, who are waiting to pour into you. And again, I think with a, a community like Spokane, particularly it was just kind of that nice mid-size spot. It's amazing how you could feel isolated or you could feel them. And then all of a sudden you just start the beauty of that interconnectivity. You just start moving little things here and there. And then all of a sudden this whole opens up, this whole thing opens up. All these people who have been waiting to meet you too, mm -hmm. um, things that need your help and have been waiting for your involvement. But the flip side of that too is taking advice from people who you want your life to look like. That, that's a, that's you know, a good one. Um, a lot of people have a lot of great advice, but if you don't want to be, you're like, why blank, would I take that advice? I why don't would you be taking that advice? It's great yeah. advice. And that, when I talk to someone, like, if you don't want your life to look like me or this part, of life, then don't take this advice because right. this is what this means, right? And you may say, well, that make me miserable. Maybe, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that um, are great for all sorts of people. I know who just wouldn't be a great fit for me, right? So grab grab bagging those those pieces you want. When you think about, uh, un next unfair question, when you think about, <laughs> appreciate the warning. <laughs> um, for you now, and I'm sure it changed, but like, what, what is the big picture when you think about, you talk about obviously your parents and grandparents being great role models and mentors mm -hmm. to you amongst other people, but, um, you got all these things you're doing. Um, it's what, one of the reasons I was so excited to have you I've always enjoy just chatting with you. Um, but, what what is let's say what's the end game? But what is, what is the picture that you're trying to paint? What is yeah? This? I hope we're not at the end when we say end game. But yeah, uh, since we established you're like 98 years old. Oh yeah, that was a previous story. <laughs> yeah, actually 44. But had somebody say <laughs> mid 50s? Come on. Uh, no, but uh, if we're not at the end game, you're a person of intention. There's even if the picture is going to change, there's some there's this picture you're trying to paint. What is, what is that picture? Yeah, that is a really good question. So I am going to literally walk out of here today thinking more and more about that. But I, I, I'm in a good spot right mm -hmm. at the moment in terms of I, I, I think I am a person of intention, but I'm, I am doing what I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you asked that question earlier in terms of are there things you're not able to do because of the things that I've... Are you up to speed on Game of Thrones? Uh, no, I don't watch that. My wife does, huh? Okay. I know, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not up to speed, but it's come on. It's stacked I, up with about three years, i.e. my child is three years old, yeah. of things uh, <laughs> that I haven't watched. But I have read or watched enough surrounding the new season coming out that I, I know at least. Don't tell me. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end. So, 17 years from now, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> it's one of the most popular shows of all time. I've seen some. I, I would say uh, for me, because of the age of my kids right now, uh, is... Uh, to be present and as active with them at 12 and 14, uh, middle school and high school, to try to experience every opportunity that I can with them. Uh, you know, because those are those things you start thinking in your mid 40s. Wait, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. They're they're not going to be at this stage forever. So from just a personal standpoint, I I want to be present and take take all that in, so I don't miss anything mm -hmm. uh, for me and for them, and and try to as we've been talking about mentor mentee type relationships, hopefully I can be one of those parents that uh, is trying to ascertain what, what is right for them and what they want to do. You know, do they want to go practice law? Probably not, but if they did great, but if it's something else, I want to be 
passionate and on board with assisting them in, in moving forward uh, with their respective endeavors. It doesn't have to be mine. Like I mm -hmm. said, you know, other folks in my uh, family weren't attorneys, but my family was supportive ultimately of me going down this path or that. I'd like to do that for my kids mm -hmm. and be supportive of uh, what they're doing. Business-wise, again, I'm in a good place. Uh, again, my partner, Becky Wheeler, in our law office, uh, we have a good team. Uh, we're handling work that we enjoy, very diverse type of work. Uh, we associate with many other attorneys in town on certain cases. Uh, uh, Todd Startzel is another attorney here in town that I have a lot of respect for that we work on uh, some cases together because uh, different expertise come into the table. Uh, with Spokane Talks, uh, uh, I've been very fortunate to work with Ken Adams and, and learn a lot about the media business. And again, just just enjoy what I'm doing and mm -hmm. engaging in our community. Uh, I'd just like to see us continue. I don't, I don't even know with Spokane Talks. I don't necessarily think that you're looking to grow per se, but rather continue to uh, experience the uh, quality of content mm -hmm. and continue to do that mm -hmm. and, and meet great people in our area doing great things. Softball, maybe hardball. All right. But curious as a dad, how do you... I'll speak for me and you can either, uh, 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 you can let me know how you think. About I, one of the things I balance, because people talk work-life balance, mm -hmm. right? and it is a personal thing. Um, most of the time when I hear people talk about work-life balances, there's not a lot of work involved. Hmm. Um, at least on the surface. <laughs> right, right. And my point to that is so many of the great moms and point, dads actually. that I know are doing a thousand things mm -hmm. and Everybody they're being is. great dads mm -hmm. and moms. Yeah. Um, and for me, I mean, I've, there's a lot that I don't do now. I found what most of what I had to give up had to do with me, mm. not my community, not my business. Um, TV. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Not a good, Game get to watch as much said. sports <laughs> on TV as I, as I want, as I might want to, but I've always looked at it. Um, so I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts of like, I also want my kids to see, I mean, theoretically every minute I'm working, you know, on a board of a nonprofit mm -hmm. volunteering somewhere is a minute I could be with my kids. Right. Right. <clears throat> And so it's not that any of those things per se I view as more important than my children. No, nope, I know. But I've always looked at it too is I also want my kids to see me working hard. I also want my kids to see me caring about the community. I, I also want my kids to know that while they're infinitely important to me, it's a big world and we need mm -hmm. to look beyond just ourselves and our own selfish needs. And for me, that's how I try to bring some balance to that or justify a <laughs> time away. No, I think it makes but sense. I don't know. How do you think? Because you're a busy guy, right? I mean, you I could so leave work and go straight home or do this or do that. Yep. And you've got other things you're involved with. So how I do think you, I, how do you bring it specifically to your kids? How do you bring that into? Yeah, we're going to have to talk more about this because I'm curious because you're in a very similar profession where there's no end, right? I mean, it's yeah. just uh, you call it for the day and start over the next day. So I think I'm fairly similar to the way you described it, that uh, I, I try to, I think you used a good word there, either justification or in our mind or, you know, everybody's different. I'm by no means perfect. I don't try to walk in somebody else's shoes and or mm -hmm. begin to pretend yeah. pretend that I know better than they. But uh, in, in my case, you know, obviously the kids being in school and being in their own respective activities, mm -hmm. that's definitely a gauge. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's just simply, am I missing something? Mm -hmm. uh, and so during the work day, they're in school. And so I go give it everything I got uh, during the day. I, most days of the week, I get the opportunity to take the kids to school. That's a big luxury for me, you know, because they're hitting school in the seven o'clock range. So mm -hmm. I get that opportunity to take them to school and then I head off to the office or respective meetings. And uh, in the evening, though, I think you're right, Tim, you you, you do have to make uh, some decisions about, well, am I going to go to that event or that event? But I think the way you just indicated is actually uh, a pretty good way to look at it, which is, hey, we want our kids to see that we are passionate about uh, the things that we do because we want them to be passionate about what they're doing and see that model. Yeah. So you do your your best to, you, yeah. hey, I, on Thursday night, I'm going to be at the such and such function. But 
but when it comes down to their uh, specific, like whether my daughter's very involved in musical theater and my son has been involved in that, uh, I'm not going to miss their activities. Mm-hmm. Pretty much plain and simple. So mm-hmm. no matter what it is business-wise, I'm not willing to, to miss those opportunities. Cool. Last last question. Where do people find you? I know I know you're active with Spokane Talks and McNeese Wheeler on mm-hmm. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. To, yeah, most of those. Where, where are people going to find any of your activities? Yeah, I'd say uh, most of the social media platforms, uh, McNeeseWheeler.com, uh, and then using that particular description, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, McNeese Wheeler is going to be on that for our law office and Spokane Talks or Spokane Talks Media uh, on the same platforms. Same platforms. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. Look forward to having you back soon. Tim, thank you so much. I appreciate it. (laughs) Take care.